Good evening and welcome to the June 24th, 2024 meeting of the Menlo Park Planning Commission. I am Chair Jennifer Schindler and I thank you for joining us this evening, either remotely or here in Council Chambers. Established by state law, our city's planning commission is composed of seven volunteer residents of Menlo Park appointed to four-year terms by the city council. Our planning commission is not a policy setting body, that's the city council. We are a policy implementing body. We review development proposals for compliance with our city's general plan and zoning ordinances, which can both be found on the city's website. The commission also reviews city initiated land use pro planning projects, such as general plan updates and zoning ordinance amendments. The commission reviews development proposals requiring a use permit, architectural control, a variance, minor subdivision, as well as the environmental reviews associated with those projects. When applicable, the Planning Commission reviews the below market rate or BMR housing agreements associated with these applications. The Commission is the final decision making body for these applications unless appealed to the City Council. The Commission also serves as the recommending body to the City Council for major subdivisions, rezoning, conditional development permits, zoning ordinance amendments, general plan amendments, and environmental reviews associated with those projects. If applicable, the Planning Commission reviews and makes recommendations on BMR agreements associated with these projects. We work closely with staff in our city's planning division, which is responsible for implementing implementation of the general plan, zoning ordinances, and related policies. We encourage your act active participation, whether you are an applicant or an interested member of the public. And there will be an opportunity to speak publicly for each specific agenda item, as well as for general public comment. With that, I will call roll. Uh, Commissioner Peruzzi. Here. Commissioner Doe. Present. Uh, Vice Chair Eric is absent. Um, Commissioner Farrick. Here. Commissioner Sillen. Here. And Commissioner Silverstein. Present. I'm Chair Schindler. I am also present. So we have six commissioners in chambers, which is a quorum. The next item on our agenda uh, is reports and announcements. Mr. Parada, are there any staff reports or announcements this evening? Uh, yes, thank you. Good evening, Chair Schindler and members of the commission. Uh, so staff does have a few announcements to make. So the first one, as the commission is aware, the uh, Community Development Department released the draft environmental impact report for the Parkline Master Plan Project located on the SRI campus uh, just across the street here. Uh, so that began on Thursday the 20th, a 45-day comment period on the, or on the content and analysis in the EIR. Uh, that does end at 5.30 p.m. on August 5th, that's a Monday. Uh, during that time, the Planning Commission is scheduled at its meeting on July 22nd to uh, hold a public hearing on the draft EIR to solicit comments from the community as well as the uh, Planning Commission, and then also hold a study session to provide general feedback and comments uh, and ask questions of the applicant team. Uh, and another announcement, uh, the Planning Commission had previously approved the 1220 Hoover Street use permit and architectural control project and recommended to the council um, approval of the final, or the, sorry, of the uh, major subdivision associated with the project. That, that project was appealed. The appeal has now been scheduled officially for the July 9th meeting. So the city council at its July 9th meeting will review uh, the appeal of the Planning Commission's approval as well as the recommendation on the approval of the um, vesting tent of map and that concludes my reports and announcements happy to answer any questions i have a follow-up question on the 1220 hoover appeal was there ever i either that i missed or maybe went to city council um clarity on the legal questions around what specifically uh in terms of um uh, concessions that we were able to essentially adjudicate in, in regards to that project. And I, I know that was something that was potentially ambiguous during our, our planning meeting. And I'm wondering if there was kind of full clarity on this topic for the city council meeting. Um, I don't have an update on that at this time. Happy to follow up separately. Um, to the extent that it is applicable to the appeal, it would be included in the staff report uh, if, if necessary.
Thank you. Do commissioners have any other questions about those announcements or any uh, of their own reports or announcements? Okay. Um, hearing none, uh, we will move on to the next section of our agenda, which is public comment. Um, under public comment, the public may address the commission on any subject not listed on the agenda. Each speaker may address the commission once under public comment for a limit of three minutes. You're not required to provide your name, district, city, neighborhood, or city of residence, but it is helpful. The commission cannot act on items not listed on the agenda, and therefore the commission cannot respond to non-agenda issue issues brought up under public comment other than to provide general information. Um, please know that if you are here tonight to comment on one of our agenda items, you will have a chance to speak when we get to that item in the agenda. To learn how to participate, I'm going to, and then to um, start our uh, public comment period, I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Began um, for an explanation and to begin the public comment period. Thank you, Chair Schindler. Regarding procedures for communicating for those presenting on an item on tonight's agenda, we kindly ask that you turn on your microphone and webcam during your presentation for your item. During the public comment period, members of the public will have an opportunity to share their comments or questions by clicking on the hand icon on your screen upon which staff will introduce you and activate your microphone. Alternatively, for those calling into tonight's meeting, please press star nine on your keypad to notify staff that you have a comment. For member, members of the public who are sharing a Zoom account or phone line with another commenter during this meeting, please inform staff at the start of your public comment and staff will ensure that the other commenter speaks after you've finished your comment. If you are participating in person, please fill out a comment card and bring it to me. Uh, with that said, I hand it back to you, Chair Sidler. Thank you, Ms. Began. Um, at this time, do we have any requests, either in person or on Zoom, um, for public comment, general public comment? Thank you, Chair Schindler. At this time, I do not see any hands um, online and I have not received any public comment cards. Um, but we can give it a minute if you'd like. I'll give it one, one couple of seconds. Um, I, I can confirm that no public comments have been submitted. Thank you very much. Um, then we will go ahead and close a general public comment and move on to the next portion of our agenda, which is the consent calendar. Um, tonight, there are two items on the consent calendar, um, approval of the Planning Commission meeting minutes for May 20th and June 3rd. Um, are there any updates? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, staff was made aware prior to the meeting that uh, for the attendance for the May 20th meeting, it uh, errantly did not include Commissioner Doe. So if it's amenable to the commission as part of its vote, uh, staff will make that uh, edit after the fact. Thank you. So for the May 20th meeting, the addition of Chair Doe um, in the attendance. Any clarifying questions from commissioners? All right, seeing none, uh, Ms. Began, could we call for public comment on the consent calendar at this time? Thanks, Chair Schindler. Um, as a reminder, you're welcome to speak on this public comment period by raising your hand with the hand icon on Zoom or by pressing star nine if calling in by phone. And if you're participating in person, please fill out a comment card and bring it to me. So um, as of right now, I do not see any hands raised and have not received any comment cards. I'm comfortable closing uh, public comment on the consent calendar at this time. Um, so let's, um, just before we um, go forward, I'd like to just ask, do any of my commissioners have uh, a desire to pull any items from the consent calendar? Okay, great. Um, then if we have a motion and a second. I move uh, to, to approve both consent calendar items or consent calendar. We have a first from Commissioner Farrick uh, to approve the consent calendar. Um, and I would probably with with the modification, the addition of, of Commissioner Doe to the May 20th. May 20th yes. Meeting. Okay. Second. And a second from Commissioner Slime. Um, we shall, I will go ahead and call the vote on this one. Um, so for the approval of the consent calendar, Commissioner Barusi. Yes. Commissioner Doe. Yes, and just, just for the record, second from Commissioner Silversee. 
Oh, I might have misheard I, uh, Commissioner the, the Sillen. Oh, okay, Commissioner Silverstein. <laughs> thank you for thank you for correcting. Yes. Me. Perfect. Um, Commissioner Doe was a yes. yes. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Farrick. Yes. Commissioner Sillen. Yes. Commissioner Silverstein. Yes. And I am also a yes. So that is six yeses um, and no uh, no's. All right. Uh, with that, we will move on to the public hearing component of our agenda. Um, there are two items uh, in the public hearing section. Um, item F1 is a public uh, hearing with regard to um, 256 Marmona Drive. Uh, staff has recommended that this item be um, uh, continued to a future date. Um, I'm go still going to go ahead and read the item uh, and take a public comment on it, uh, but then we will move into a vote um, to uh, continue this to a future date per staff recommendation. Uh, so this is a request for a use permit to add a second story and remodel remodel an existing non-conforming one-story single-family residence on a substandard lot with regard to minimum lot width in the R1U single-family urban residential zoning district. The proposal would exceed 50% of the existing floor area and is considered equivalent to a new structure. The proposed work would also exceed 50% of the existing replacement value of the existing non-conforming structure in a 12-month period and to determine this action is categorically exempt under CEQA gui guidelines section 15301's class one exemption for existing facilities. Um, so Ms. Began, uh, just given that this was publicly noticed, I'd like to give a, an opportunity for public comment for anyone who um, may have assumed this was going to be part of our discussion this evening. So could you call for public comment on F1? Uh, yes. Um, so as of right now, I've not received any um, comment cards and do not see any hands raised online, but um, just as a reminder um, for those, sorry, um, for those calling in, in tonight, tonight's meeting, please press star nine on your phone. Um, and if you are in person, um, you may please hand me a comment card and uh, I will call your name. Um, do we have any hands raised or comment cards? I do not see any hand raise, hands raised and have not received any comment cards. Okay, um, thank you. Um, having given an opportunity, I will close public comment on this one. Um, and at this time, um, I'd like to hope, see if the commission can put forth a, a motion to, um, to essentially continue. continue this one to a future date. We have a. I move to continue this item to a future date. Second. I'll second it. Okay. We have a, a first and a second. Um, first from Commissioner Farrick, second from Commissioner Peruzzi. Um, so let's go ahead and vote on continuing this one to a future date. All right. Commissioner Peruzzi. Yes. Commissioner Doe. Yes. Commissioner Farrick. Yes. Commissioner Sillen. Yes. Commissioner Silverstein. Yes. All right, that is, and I am also a yes. That is six yeses, um, no dissent. And so we will move this to a future date. All right, well, we will now move on to F2, um, a public hearing regarding eight Homewood Place uh, in which the Planning Commission will consider a request for a use permit for hazardous materials, specifically diesel fuel, associated with a proposed permanent emergency generator to service an existing commercial building in the C1 administrative or professional restrictive zoning district, De and determine this action is categorically exempt under CEQA guidelines, Section 15301's Class 1 exemption for existing facilities. Um, Mr. Pruder, are there updates or additions to the staff report? Thank you and good evening, Chair Schindler, Planning Commissioners, members of the public. <clears throat> Excuse me. There are a few updates I'd like to share this evening following the uh, publication of the staff report. Uh, we uh, first 
received a comment letter, which I've shared with you via email and also in hard copy this evening. There are also copies, uh, hard copies at the back counter here at the council chambers. Um, and this was uh, one comment we received this afternoon. And uh, it was a comment that involved a few topics, which include the location of the generator, the testing timing, the, the time of day in which the test uh, would occur for the generator, the duration of generator usage in the event of a power outage or emergency, consideration of batteries as a form of backup power, and also communication. Um, and so uh, that's the first update. And then the second update, um, I'll be sharing my screen. We have um, identified a, um, an additional detail, uh, courtesy of the applicant, uh, clarifying that there is a desire with this use permit request to have one testing period a year be one hour and a half long. Uh, they need, uh, per some federal requirements with respect to the uh, usage and testing of the generator to do one test uh, per year that's longer than the, the original request, which would be 30 minute periods once a month. And so I'm going to present now um, the following uh, proposed language, uh, revising the um, slightly revising the language here of the condition, uh, condition 2A specifically, which involves the testing timing as well as the testing uh, duration. And so it's simply adding uh, the area, the phrase that I've put in red and underlined. Uh, so I'll read that aloud quickly. Testing of the generator shall be limited to one 30 minute period per month and one additional two hour period per year between the daytime hours of 8.30 a.m. and 5.30 p.m. on weekdays. And um, with that update, I am uh, available for any other questions. We have nothing else in terms of updates at this time, but following that, I will uh, introduce the applicant team. Uh, there is one representative who will come up and have some opening remarks, but I'm happy to answer any questions you might have to start. Thank you. At this time, do any commissioners have clarifying questions for Mr. Pruder? About, specifically about the update. I think maybe perhaps we shall hold other clarifying questions until after the applicant has had a chance to, to make opening remarks. I, I have one clarifying question about the update. Is it our expectation that tests will be run for that additional two hour period on top of the once per month. It says, I mean, the, the, the recommended modification says that it will be limited to, but is it the expectation that that would actually occur and that's gonna be part of the testing schedule? Yes, I believe that's correct. Okay. All right, seeing no other clarifying questions for that particular update from Mr. Pruder. Um, I would welcome the applicant to um, make remarks, uh, as I understand was the plan. We can't. Your mic is not on quite yet. Let's be sure we can we can hear you in the testing. There we go. Oh, Better. thank you. Thank you. I am Deborah Locks. I am one of the partner physicians and the practice director of Reproductive Science Center. We are so happy to be here tonight and thank you commissioners for uh, inviting us and for hearing us tonight. First, I just wanted to rep uh, introduce who's here with me. So first is Kathy Wheeler. She's the executive director of our practice. Next is Dr. Sarah Reed. She is also one of the partner physicians of the practice. Then we have JJ Riestra. He's the architect on the project. Then we have Lawrence Jones. He's the uh, electrical engineer. And then last, we have Adam Thompson, who's the acoustical engineer. Then also available remotely, we've got April Hatton, Allison Dar, and Tucker Matthews, who are also available. So just by way of a little bit of background, uh, Reproductive Science Center was founded 41 years ago, and we have been an active fertility practice since that time. 
we started in the East Bay and our initial uh, fertility center was based in San Ramon and we have grown since that time. We've always had a strong desire to be able to provide fertility services on this side of the bay and finding the right time and the right location has been the critical piece. When we found Eight Homewood, a freestanding building and based on where we were in terms of our practice growth, we were thrilled to find that location and are very, very excited to be able to expand our fertility services. I am a resident of Menlo Park. I live in the Willows. Um, we are so thrilled at the opportunity to be able to expand here. We did our outreach event in May and were able to set up um, an event in the afternoon on the weekend and the feedback from the neighbors was very, very excited to have um, a fertility center in town and the um, overall feeling matched the enthusiasm that we have for the project as well. So thank you for hearing us and we look forward to our discussion tonight. Thank you and welcome. Um, do we have clarifying questions um, for staff or for the applicant before we move to public comment? Commissioner Barusi. I have a few questions. Um, first of all, just to frame this for me, and forgive me if this is buried somewhere in the staff report. I read it through a couple of times, but may have missed it. Um, this specific kind of generator, how common is this in other places in Menlo Park? I know that individuals buy diesel generators for their homes, but for this level, this decibel level, et cetera, what, what else is out there already? Um, thank you for your question, Commissioner Beruzzi. Uh, I would say that in our uh, recent experience with the Planning Commission and use permits generally, we've had a few projects along these lines that involve a commercial type use requesting as well as residential uses, we have a few uh, multifamily residential buildings that are similarly sized and scaled um, in terms of square footage and building type that have requested and received a use permit for one diesel generator, generally along these lines for backup purposes. Um, the specific nature of the backup energy may vary if it's residential for residents living in the building versus a use like this, which is more based on the functions of the commercial use specifically uh, but there have been in my recollection i have had at least three in the last four years or so that have gone to the planning commission and received approval so that's helpful so then when they've actually been installed um have we had issues with the testing um has the decibel level been about what we would have expected it to be um what's happened after those were approved sure um I may follow up with a few questions on, on that note, but to start with, I think the main points to take away would be that we've had approvals. Uh, this type of project would follow up with a building permit application and then through that process receive that level of inspection and approval from the building division as well as other reviewers. And I would also add that the other issue concerning noise and activity and safety is, is obviously regulated uh, through a variety of means. Um, this type of use would require hazardous materials um, permitting through hazardous materials business plan with the San Mateo County Environmental Health Services Division. And in addition to that, um, you know, in terms of any complaints or issues with code enforcement, I, I'm not aware of anything that's happened with these different types of generators on site. Okay, thanks. So shifting gears for a minute, I wanted to ask about parking requirements. Um, so was the parking requirement based on the usage? Is it a medical clinic related parking requirement or is it sort of a more generic commercial business parking requirement? Um, and then I was gonna get a little specific about this particular kind of clinic, um, wondering if the parking needs might be different than your average medical facility. Thank you. Uh, the C1 zoning district for which this property is located has one flat parking rate. So regardless of the actual use on site, the same okay. rate would apply. Okay. Um, maybe the applicant has um, insight into what you would anticipate the parking usage would be. I think 
you know, it seems like one of the issues hinges on a city requirement for X number of parking spaces. And I'm really curious about whether or not we actually think those are all going to be required at the same time. So um, the way our general operations work is we do procedures in the mornings and um, ultrasound monitoring in the mornings. And then starting at around 10 a.m. until about 4 o'clock, we have patients coming in for new patient appointments and follow-up appointments. I believe we have 107 spots, parking spots. That's correct. Yeah, so that is very, very ample for the, the needs of our clinic. We generally have two doctors working at once, seeing, you, you know, seven to 10 patients a day. Um, and then the morning monitoring is when more of the um, more spots would be used when patients are coming in for procedures or monitoring. Okay, so it sounds like five parking spaces, give or take, probably wasn't going to break the the mold here. Um, so you, you give, you're saying giving up those? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering as we as we start to talk about the trade offs associated with this, because of course it's always about trade offs. Um, when, and wondering just how essential those spots are. You know, some kinds of, in other cases, we would have had maybe like a use study or a casual observation of parking occupancy beforehand, but you're new, so we don't have a track record. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious, based on your experience with other places. Um, yes, I, I don't think we're worried that we are going to run out of. Oh, thank you, that's so helpful. Yes. Do other commissioners have clarifying questions? Okay, I have two quick, oh, sorry, two, two, two quick ones, uh, Mr. Pruder, and, and then we'll go to Commissioner Sillen. Um, one is about noise analysis. Um, one is about the total hours capacity of the backup generator. Um, and then I, I guess I had a question about parking spaces, very similar to what Commissioner Peruzzi asked, and I may just ask one clarifying on top of that. Um, so on the noise analysis, um, the scenario where both the generator and the air handling unit were running um, was sort of the maximum noise creation that was laid out in the staff report. And I wanted to be sure that I understood the scenarios in which both of those two things would be running. Um, my understanding is that the only time when both of them would be running, both the generator and the air handling unit, is if um, the generator is being tested during the daytime hours. And so they would both be running for 30 minutes or once a year up to two hours. And then the second example, the second use case when they would both be running is if there were a power outage and both the um, air handling unit and the generator would be running. Are those the only two scenarios? Am, am I correct? Are those two scenarios when they'd both be running? Are there, and are there any more that where both of them would be running? Thank you for your question. Uh, yes, that would be correct. Those are the two scenarios that would involve both running. And I, yeah, that, as, as indicated in the study. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then my next question is, is about, um, there is in the agency referral forms for the backup generator, it talks about there being a, how much um, runtime would come from a full tank um, of diesel. And I believe the form for in one of the agency referral forms said it would allow the generator to run for 48 hours. And I wanted to see if that was 48 hours running on the limited services that were talked about um, by the applicant, just the procedure rooms and making sure that embryos could be put into long-term storage. Um, in other words, I think the, the language I've got here is limited, let's see, select equipment, limited HVAC within the labs, and backup to only selected power circuits and limited HVAC. In other words, it's not the entire building. So is it 48 hours of power in the limited capacity or to the full building? I'd like to defer to the applicant for this question. My understanding is their usage and intention would be for just the limited effort, but they can confirm. Thank you. 
Hi. So uh, the 48 hour runtime uh, is a worst case scenario uh, based on uh, everything operating at full load. So uh, in the event of an outage, it could last 48 hours uh, before needing to refuel. Uh, I'll defer to the uh, physician team as to how long they would actually need in order to get everything into long-term storage. Okay, so 48 hours of the full electrical draw of the building or for the, the, subs circuits. the subset of, I'm sorry. The, uh, there, uh, there is no capability to put the entire building on the generator even if okay. we wanted to. Okay, so it's, it's 48 hours for the defined capacity that we, it was in the report just, yes. just for the, the generator. Yes, that's okay. correct. Okay, thank you, that's, that's very helpful. Can I ask um, a follow-up question on that 48 hours while we still have the applicant available? Please. Um, as part of the staff report, it says uh, regarding gener generator refueling, it says that refueling occurs once per year and the generator uses minimal fuel, approximately 1% of its total capacity during testing. If it's going to be tested for a half hour every month, that would be six hours. If that's 1% of the total fuel, that would imply that it could run for 600 hours. And I'm trying to figure out what the delta is between 600 and 48. So uh, what we're required to calculate our runtime based on is if the air handler is running at its full, uh, full power, which means that it is the hottest day of the year and there is also a power outage. On top of that, every single piece of equipment within the lab is running at its full load. So we don't know exactly how long uh, the fuel tank capacity would be in a scenario where it's 70 degrees outside, but there's a power outage. Uh, but testing occurs uh, usually not at those peak times. So if we were to test in, uh, say, the fall, where it's not very hot outside uh, and it's not very cool, then we wouldn't be using much fuel at all. We would really, uh, you can think of it like, uh, this is a diesel engine just like your car is an engine. Uh, you can think of the test in the fall as you're idling at a stoplight almost. Uh, and the test, um, that hour and a half test that's under full load is like you're going down the road at 60 miles per hour. So obviously you use more fuel going down the road at 60 miles per hour uh, and you use a lot less when you're idling. But as far as an exact calculation of on this day, what runtime could we get? Uh, that would involve a lot more in-depth analysis. Thank you for the additional detail. Um, and just to, to make the number clear, uh, I believe Commissioner Bruzzi just asked about the current requirements um, in C1. So just numerically, what is the required number of parking places under current zoning in C1 for this project um, currently under city, city zoning? It's 106 spaces. 106 spaces under current zoning. Yes, that's right. Thank you. Um, that was, those were the only clarifying questions I had, but I believe Commissioner Sillen had a, some clarifying questions. Yes, thank you. Um, so since we were just talking about it, the, uh, yeah, I guess I'm a little confused about the potential generator runtime. It sounds like, well, at some place in the document, I was reading that the intent of the generator is to kind of keep things going in order to like let's say there's an issue with power of any sort the generator's purpose is to just keep things afloat until everything can be sort of stored and evacuated and so forth on the other hand it sounds like it could be run like if the power let's say pg e's power goes out for three four days which has happened before and it is one of these hot days where um everything's being used even in that case it could run for 48 hours and then it could be refueled and keep going so could perhaps the applicant or staff clarify um, yeah what what is the longest the community should expect this thing to be run let's say um, yeah worst case 
So uh, the intent of the generator is to provide an orderly cessation of operations. Uh, the reason it's 40, uh, we selected a 48-hour runtime is because to orderly seize operations can take several hours, uh, if not multiple days. Uh, and there is, uh, when the power first goes out, there is an initial assessment of, is this going to be out for 15 minutes, or is this going to be out for four days? Uh, if we believe the power is going to be out for 15 minutes, then we're not going to start the process of putting everything into long-term storage because, again, that can take several hours and has a lot of potential consequences with it. Um, however, if it is going to be a very long outage or we expect that, then we would, uh, over the next several hours or potentially the next two days, uh, start putting things into long-term storage. So um, is there a scenario where, let's say, you know it's going to be three days, uh, pg and &E says they'll have it back on in, in three days, and you just say, we'll just keep it running, the generator running for that period of time. Is there like a maximum number of hours that you're willing to run the generator, I suppose? So through the chair, I think we can let the applicant answer this, but we're starting to veer a little bit. Um, <clears throat> away from clarifying questions. So if, if it's after this answer, staff would recommend that we move into public comment and then bring it back to the dais for this more um, detailed discussion. Thank you. Um, so I think we're all on the same page that we would not want to be on our backup generator for long periods of time the same way the neighborhood would not want that. Um, so in a worst case scenario where we were gonna have a, a longer term outage, we would be moving as quickly as possible to be off of that backup generator too. Um, so I think the intent is not that we are using that backup generator to keep us afloat for days on end. It's really to just get us out of whatever uh, emergency situation we're finding ourselves in for patient safety and embryo safety. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Spigen, could we please go ahead um, with public comment now for um, item F2? Thank you, Chair Schindler. Um, as a reminder, you're welcome to speak on this public comment period by raising your hand with the hand icon in Zoom or by pressing star nine if calling in by phone. If you are participating in person, please fill out a comment card and bring it to me. And um, as of right now, I do not see any hands raised online and have not received any comment cards. Let's just give it one more moment. Okay, um, I can confirm that no, no um, comments have been made. Or sorry, um, I have not received any comment cards and there are no hands raised online. Thank you, Ms. Beacon. Um, then I will close public comment uh, on this item and bring the discussion uh, back to the dais ultimately for a motion, um, a motion that would also need to include Mr. Pruder's modification um, and with, re with a modification to the resolution. Uh, and so I invite commissioners to share their thoughts and questions. Um. Can we can we address the questions of the one person who emailed us? Um, there were that were laid out in the letter. Um, what, yes, I, th I think if you would like to pose the questions. Yes. Okay. Please on, on um, behalf of and par and paraphrase on behalf of. Right. Uh, so uh, one was the question about locating the generator closer to the USGS property line. And it looked like from the report, there were actually two issues with that. One of them was the parking spaces issue, which it sounds like from the applicant's perspective could be a non-issue. Um, there was something about wiring. Um, I wonder if there's clarity, anybody could offer clarity on that. Um, Hi, I'm JJ Riestra. Um, you wanna speak into the mic a little Let's be more. sure your microphone Here is we on. Know. There we go, that's perfect. So I think we, we chose that location because it was the most practical and it was the less invasive and obtrusive. It was right there close to the property. If we went out there, we were introducing um, 
one taking more parking spaces, but also getting close to um, the trees, the protected uh, heritage trees that, that are nearby. And also um, when talking to our acoustical experts, we found that we can um, we can have the same amount of meet the, the municipal cord, cord, uh, code ordinance in terms of uh, not being louder than what uh, Menlo Park kind of dictates. So that's, that's why we chose that particular spot, location where it's located now. So just to follow up on that, do we think that there would be damage to the trees? I mean, is there a place where it could go that's farther from the Kent and Waverly or Linfield, or I can't remember, I think it's Waverly, um, homes uh, closer to USGS, but a foot or two farther from the trees. I mean, I guess I'm trying to find the happy medium here. If, if we've decided, which it sounds like we have, that parking, the parking minimum that we've come up with isn't, shouldn't be a limiting factor, then I'm wondering, you know, how far we can bend to support the concerns of existing residents who probably would otherwise welcome this kind of business in the neighborhood. So one other item that is a concern is that uh, we have to route the wiring from the generator to the building. And per the electrical codes, we can only bend that route once. Um, otherwise, you won't be able to pull your wire through your conduit safely. So we actually went to the site, and uh, I have some photos we could share if we would like. And the uh, if we were to try and go closer to the USGS property line, uh, we would, one, be excavating very close to where the roots of those heritage trees are. So while we may not be directly underneath the trees, there is a very good chance that in excavating our trench, which again by code has to be 24 inches deep and will probably be at least a foot wide, there is a very good chance that we don't have a straight shot that misses all of the roots. So while we may not be directly next to the trees, uh, we didn't want to risk damaging the roots and possibly killing the trees inadvertently by having it as close as we are. Uh, there's also uh, just the issue of the amount of noise it would take uh, as we are right now. We're very close to the building, and so there's going to be minimal site work. So there's minimal trenching, minimal excavation, and not much asphalt cutting. If we were to move it much farther out, then we would be increasing just the amount of asphalt cutting, the amount of trenching, digging, and all of that just to move it a little farther away. Thanks, that's helpful. I, the next question that he had was about the testing time frame, about the 5 to 5.30 window. And I'm wondering if you can help explain that a little bit. Um, if, is, there an, is there a capacity to move it earlier without it being, OK? Yeah, we're very, very willing to be flexible on that. He had proposed a noon time testing, and um, there's no problem with that. We, we generally, in our current East Bay location, um, we assess the time based on what's going on on the particular day, but his request for it to be midday when kids are in school is very reasonable. Oh, thank you. That's great. I feel like we covered the other topics in the discussion earlier. Commissioner Sillen. Um, just want to make a quick disclosure that Today, in responding to the applicant's, or sorry, the uh, commenter's email, just acknowledging that I received the comment, I realized that we had met before a few times in passing playground kids conversation. Uh, so I don't think this interaction will bias my uh, judgment of this matter, but just wanted to disclose that. Thank you. I still don't have full clarity or understanding on the um, actual generator capacity requirement. I, I, you know, I understand that it, it's stated that a 200 kilowatt generator is required for this backup. At, at least 
for the context of my thought process is thinking about whether or not uh, a battery backup would be sufficient. Um, and so in my head, I'm thinking, okay, 200 kilowatts times a potential maximum of 48 hours. Is it 9.6 megawatts that is truly needed, which obviously would be untenable from a battery standpoint, but is that what we're talking about? Uh, yes, uh, during design, we actually did an analysis of what a battery system would take, uh, and the system would be about the size of a school bus and a half, uh, would weigh about 30,000 pounds and cost $250,000. Okay, yeah, I'm, I, I'm familiar with battery backups, and, and I know they're expensive, and, and so as long as that's the scale at which we're talking, yes. then at least it helps me put that in context. Thank you. Yes. Commissioner Sillen. Um, okay, so just wanted to give my general thoughts on this matter um, as I was thinking through it. I, I think... Um, at first, when I was reading the report, it seemed like that there was a big report on acoustics and noise, and that's certainly a concern. But um, with this uh, public comments and the discussion we're having now, I think there's an additional concern of um, emissions and you know, a particular matter going into the air. Uh, and the reason this whole permit exists, this permit is required, is because diesel is a pollutant. Um, so I think we are trying to balance the interest of a business uh, that provides medical services to the community with the interest of residents who may be subjected to this emissions, uh, pollution, if you will. And I think it's not quite clear from the report to me what is even the pollution level I know that there was a um, letter in response to Mr. Herrick, the public commenter, saying that um, it's similar to the, like the testing would provide exhaust similar to an 18 wheeler uh, engine or less than that of an 18 wheeler engine running for an hour. But in this case, the exhaust would be going up and not moving. Uh, it just all seems very vague. And so I guess, the ideal solution would be something that creates no emissions that pollute the air for nearby residents. Um, it sounds like I'm assuming the cost of this solution versus the battery of 250,000 is significantly lower. So I'm assuming that's the reason we're not going with that. And there's also other concerns, but I'm wondering, um, yeah, are there other, I mean, well, I'll start by asking, um, have there been alternative fuels considered? Like I know that natural gas was in the report, but it was dismissed because it's provided by utility, but is it possible to uh, bring it in with like a fuel truck? My understanding is that it's cleaner. Are there any other options that have been used at other facilities um, for your company besides diesel? Unfortunately, uh, technology hasn't quite gotten there where diesel is a less viable alternative than anything else. Uh, we have considered alter uh, renewable energies. Uh, unfortunately, solar power being powered by the sun and the earth blocking the sun at night uh, just isn't reliable enough, even with uh, battery backup systems. Uh, natural gas, uh, because we are dealing with life safety, um, natural gas generators have started to be able to start in less than 10 seconds, but they are tougher to find at this scale. Uh, so natural gas uh, is uh, just the generators gen uh, tend not to start as fast. And I wouldn't want to be in any kind of medical procedure where the lights go out and they take longer than 10 seconds to start back up. Uh, to the question of it being in a tank, uh, you would have the same issues um, as you do with diesel, unfortunately, uh, where you do have a fossil fuel that's stored in a tank. Um, and there are other concerns with natural gas, um, just storing that much on site. And just the volume of natural gas that would be required would require a much larger tank than the equivalent diesel tank. Um, thanks, and can you speak like for this generator is, can you speak to the emissions overall, like 
is it yeah is it similar to an 18 wheeler is there additional like filtration that's done to the exhaust can there be additional fil filtration and is it somehow directed away from the residences up into the sky like propelled that way i, I don't know uh we have included every uh catalytic converter, uh, emission reducer, uh, everything to reduce NOx that we can. Um, so it's uh, just uh, to put a couple of numbers into context, the engine on an 18 wheeler, uh, they don't officially rate them this way, but it's about 350 kilowatts. This engine is about 200 kilowatts. So the engine is already about two thirds the size of an 18 wheeler engine. I do understand the concern where your 18 wheeler is traveling down the road and bringing the exhaust with it. Uh, but in this case, the exhaust does go up and because it's uh, of how hot it is, it does go up fairly quickly. So it doesn't take long for it to rise above the plane of the neighbor's roof. So unless you're standing on a 200 foot ladder, uh, you probably wouldn't see any exhaust fumes with where the generator is at your house or at the neighbor's house. Thanks. Yeah, that was something confusing in the response to the Mr. Herrick's email was that on one hand it said, like you said, it would just float up in the air and it wouldn't even touch the residences. But on the other hand, it said it would be similar to living in your apartment would be similar for a month would be similar to like driving on the road for an hour. So I guess is it should we pretty much be thinking of it as this exhaust won't reach the apartments nearby because it's going to go up for sure or is it like if it's a cold day it might waft in there uh it's not going to reach the apartments on a cold day the exhaust would actually rise up a lot faster ah pardon me <laughs> forgot <laughs> high school science okay uh, i'll pause there and let other commissioners comment thank you commissioner doe thank you chair schindler <clears throat> i appreciate the um how my fellow commissioners are elevating um, Mr. Herrick's concerns. I, I'm just going to quickly share a personal experience. Six years ago, when, when I first moved to Menlo Park, before I knew about decibel limits or hazardous materials, I, I didn't even know that diesel generators were bad for you. But across the street, there was an office building doing construction work, and they had a big old generator. And aside from whatever we were breathing in, the noise just traveled through the ground. And um, our, my family had to listen to it for two weeks every day. It was awful. So every time a generator comes before the planning commission, I remember that and I, I genuinely feel um, Mr. Herrick's concerns, I think his are less about noise and more about health for his son in the bedroom window. That said, I um, appreciate that you are all dealing with something very fragile and delicate. Um, embryos and the future of families. Um, and also, uh, going back to Commissioner Beruzzi's question about would you be open to changing the testing time? Um, so, and I, and I wouldn't even want you to go to natural gas. I mean, natural gas is a whole other problem we got to get off of, too. Um, and, I, and I know you weren't, you know, a proponent of that. Um, so I, I just wanted to throw in my voice. I, this is, you know, no one wants a diesel generator in, in their backyard. And, but just, for the fact that you're open to adjusting testing time and that this is really just for the safe cessation of operations, not to run the microwave in the mini fridge. Um, I would just like to indicate that I will support this application. We have, we have approved, this commission has approved use permits for diesel generators for other office buildings where it was not even clear what they were doing. Um, so I just wanted to share my inclination. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioner Doe. Um, I would like to sort of voice similar feelings to what Commissioner Doe very eloquently said right now, um, which is uh, appreciation for um, both the nature of the business um, and also for the work that has been done at least to investigate a variety of different options, a variety of different locations, and a variety of different possible power sources. Um, to my, what I can recall of similar application or similar requests that we've gotten, this one goes into more detail um, than any we have, we have seen about um, alternative power sources, be they natural gas, be they solar, um, and additional locations, and the, the math behind, and the little, the limitations and the benefits of different locations. Um, so I appreciate the additional detail. 
Um, I also recall the, the, some of the instances that Commissioner Doe alluded to here where we've gotten requests for backup generators, one for a financial services company and one for another biotech company. Uh, again, without this level of detail about it being for a cessation of the business practices. Um, and I think in those cases, you know, we asked the right questions, um, forwarding, uh, uh, promoting Menlo Park's objectives of, um, you know, protecting the climate, um, looking for alternative power sources. But there are instances where you do have to sort of think about what is ap applicable for the jobs, the businesses, um, and in many ways that benefits the community significantly too. Um, like Commissioner Doe, I actually thought noise was my bigger con was a big concern when I started reading through this. So I did read very carefully sort of the the additive impact of the two different noise sources. Um, they're still within our city's guidelines, um, but as a, a, a former commissioner has alluded to, even 45 decibels all day and all night can be tough. Um, so I do encourage you to, in addition to the, the barriers that are already proposed, um, continue to look for ways to reduce that noise level um, on a good neighbor basis. Um, that is something that we have, has come up in many projects to this city, that, that the noise is hard. Um, and Commissioner Doe has experienced it. All right. Um, so. Uh, with with those sentiments, I will be supporting this this um, resolution when when we come time to a vote. Commissioner Farrick. Thank you. I'm so glad I got to go after you, Chair Schindler, because you pretty much voiced everything that was in my mind. Uh, thank you for being so sensitive to the feedback. I know you're you're um, promoting health and wellness too, so I know you're not trying to you know do this because it's uh, fun to have the need for a generator. We've all experienced actually just had one this weekend, a pretty substantial power outage for a few hours and um, some melty ice maker to prove it. So uh, I know that this is a requirement now, uh, whether we want to have them or not. And I look forward to the day when there's more sustainable fuel sources or some way to reduce all emissions and sound. But for now, I'll certainly be supportive of this application. And I actually just wanted that one additive comment is that while I know it's worthy to discuss where the best place for this to be. It's actually quite close to the business building. They'll have the biggest sound impact, not the neighbors. So I'm not quite sure any other place would. It's going to impact somebody, and it's impacting themselves the most, is I guess my comment. Thank you, Commissioner Farrick. Um, I also appreciate, since you mentioned it, the, the sensitivity to, to, pro, to protecting the trees. Um, and I do think that there is a long-term future possibility that the property next door in the USGS um, space has significant opportunity to help Menlo Park meet many of its goals um, for housing, for commercial, for growth. Um, and I am interested in keeping those that keep keeping a, 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 a as open a slate as possible for those future possibilities as well too. So that crossed my mind when I was thinking about the locations. No, oh, Commissioner. Yes. Yes. I'll still resume. Um, yeah. So when it comes to approving a, a permit like this, I, I think that. Um, you know, I, I want to echo a lot of the comments that have been stated so far. M my general thought process is um, trying to figure out whether or not a generator is needed in the first place, and I'm entirely convinced that it is. This is a very reasonable use case for which we would, um, you know, require backup power. Um, the two considerations that I'm going through right now is first the location, and then to what extent a generator would be required. Um, and so the the kind of the two things that I'm thinking through my head right now is when it comes to the actual location and looking at the site map, um, the current proposed location is significantly closer to properties on Waverly Street than it is to anywhere else nearby. Um, and kind of through the train of thought that we explored earlier, 
getting rid of more parking spaces doesn't seem existential. Um, and, and so when looking at page A14 of the um, staff report, um, I'm, I'm looking at the parking spots that would be in adjacent to the property that wouldn't have more trenching, that wouldn't have other um, tree issues that wouldn't require more kinks in, in the, the cabling, um, but would be further away from Waverly and closer to the center of the parking lot. Um, it might screw up the flow to some extent and, and it would kind of divide the parking lot a little bit, but at least it would kind of center the, um, the generator and get it essentially to the midpoint of the, the property to whatever extent possible, which would um, eliminate any immediate proximity concerns with any of the Waverly residents. So my, my first kind of question, um, and, and maybe after I'm done talking, the, the applicant can kind of um, let me know whether or not um, the parking spots of 63, 4, and 5 um, could house the generator would be an interesting uh, topic of conversation. And then just the second thing I wanted to bring up is, is while it sounds like a full generator of this size is required for the just-in-case, and it sounds like solar and battery backup wouldn't be sufficient in and of themselves, I think it would be great if maybe separate from this conversation, you explored having solar and even a smaller battery backup so that every time the power goes out for 10 seconds, you don't have to spin up the whole generator. Um, and even if it's for you know the 20 kilowatt hour capacity of a short power outage, something that goes on and off, you have an immediate backup that is clean, that's not requiring you know a, a massive 200 kilowatt batter, uh, diesel engine spinning up every time, which from a sound perspective and from a, an emissions perspective uh, can be rather disruptive. So those are my like two general thoughts on this, um, but I, I don't think either of them are, are would arise to the point of declining this permit application. So I, I guess my explicit question is, is there any reason why we would not be able to locate the generator on spot parking spots labeled 64 through 66 or however many spots it would take? Is there any way you can pull that up on the screen so we can see exactly which spots you're talking about? It's before you get to the handicapped parking spots. Mr. Pruder, can you put that up? Please, Chair, I'll put it up Thank right you now. So Thank much. you. Sorry. And, and so the, the two pages I'm looking at are um, A5 and A14. A14 here shows the, the parking spot map um, to whatever extent you guys can see that from down there. And then A5 is um, page 35 of the overall agenda, which has the overall site map and just highlighting how the current proposal is significantly skewed towards one um, portion of the lot as opposed to in the midpoint. Through the chair, while the applicant um, prepares their response, I do want to identify at this moment, since we're talking about a parking reduction, that the, the city does have a minimum parking requirement for this zoning district that cannot be reduced below uh, without a specific use-based request that requires additional review by staff. If the commission is inclined to go that way, we could not act upon that reduction this evening because that was not part of the notice. Um, but this location in the C1 district, I also want to note that it's one for 200, uh, one space for 200 square feet. That's also our recommended parking rate for medical offices. Um, so staff uses that as its initial guide. There certainly can be adjustments, but I do want to make that announcement at this moment since it feels like the appropriate time. Thank you for that additional detail. Uh, 
We have, uh, operationally, uh, we have no concerns about moving to 63, 4, and 5, um, pending the issue of uh, needing to do another process through the city to relocate there and take away the parking. I'd like to make a comment, if possible. Who is can you, um, we, can, we can hear you. Could you please, I think this is one of the additional um, members of the applicant team who is speaking. Uh, if you could just identify yourself, that would be great. We can hear you. Do we do we know which of the additional members of the applicant team was was wishing to speak? Sorry, can you can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please uh, proceed. Okay, there. We go. Sorry, this is Allison Darham with E4H. Um, my question, both to Lawrence and to JJ, is based upon positioning it at 63, 64, 65, and possibly 66. Do we believe that the number of the run of conduit and the number of kinks would be able to avoid those three trees that are located in front of the building? And would that be an issue? Uh, there is a risk that we would uh, damage the root system to those trees. Uh, we would most likely uh, forgive me because uh, I haven't drawn this out, but it looks like we might be able to get away with a 45 degree bend um, and possibly miss them. But that also does run the risk that the roots grow into the conduits. As the, because uh, uh, if I recall correctly, those are very young trees um, that are going to age. Um, but I think we're planning on encasing the conduits in concrete anyway. I, I think the very next page has a actual image of those trees without leaves. Uh, yes. So uh, yeah, it would require a lot more coordination and there is more room for error if we were to relocate there. Commissioner Farrick. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to make a comment. I don't particularly like this, that suggestion looking at the picture with the trees, then we this structure would be blocking the fenestration of the frontage of the building and it just I understand what you're trying to achieve but I don't honestly think it would do much because the way the sound study looks it's still going to be very similar in nature to what it is today and it's been designed and not only that we would they would need to go through a redesign and thus delay further so I guess you know I, I appreciate the intent of trying to get there but I think you know, keeping it, uh, I, I would like to actually make a motion, if I may be so bold, is to support this um, motion, support this application per the staff report for the um, hazardous use materials. What is it? Sorry, I'm scanning through what this is called. Approve the use permit for hazardous materials diesel fuel for a new permanent energy generator to service an existing commercial office in the C1 administrative and professional restrictive zoning district. Uh, which is at 8 Homewood Place. Is that the right address? Sorry. I'm so uh, we have a, a first here from Commissioner Farrick. Um, Commissioner Farrick, does your first include Mr. Pruder's uh, modification to the resolution that would add an, a testing period of two hours once per year in addition to what's currently written in the resolution? Yes, because it's a federal requirement. Thank you. May I ask one more question about the motion before I second it? Um, is it possible to include in the motion um, the suggestion that the applicant seemed amenable to of, of moving the time of day of the testing? Okay. Great idea. Thank you. I would like to 
accept that friendly amendment and uh, leave it um, up to the applicant to work with neighbors on the most optimal time for testing on that monthly test. With that friendly, but, ah, I can't talk tonight. With that friendly amendment, I would second the motion. Thank you. Um, we have a first from Commissioner Farrick and a second from Commissioner Peruzzi. Um, any further discussion on the motion before we on the the motion and the second before we proceed? Commissioner Sillen. Um, just a quick note to say that I appreciate. I I also want to say that I appreciate the um, all the documentation report. I think that the noise levels seem fairly uh, mild, um, especially compared to something like a gas powered leaf blower uh, or anything like that. Not that, you know, we should be adding more noise like that, but, um, and I uh, appreciate Commissioner Farrick saying that, yeah, I th it probably would remain around the same regardless of where the uh, generator goes. And I appreciate knowing that the pollution is seemingly not a concern because it's going to rise above the windows of the nearby residences. So I would like to support the motion. Commissioner Silverstein. Yeah, I, Commissioner Farrick, if you are amenable to this, I would prefer to include explicit language around the testing time. Um, section 2.1.b of the uh, the um, actual resolution um, says the proposed generator would only be used during a power outage and once monthly for 30 minutes of testing on a Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday during daytime hours. If instead of daytime hours, we could just have a no later than 3 p.m., um, that would ensure that kids aren't home from school and we can just have that concern entirely alleviated. I'd want to look to the applicant to make, it sounds like that would be an acceptable um, parameter from a time perspective. So yes, that's fine with me. Do we need a re-second or is that sufficient language for staff to incorporate? Do we have enough, enough um clarity on the additions to what is currently documented in the resolution. Thank you for checking. Um, just to read that back, the intention here with the current motion on the table is to basically uh, approve, uh, as provided in the staff report, with the modifications to condition 2A that would basically uh, involve the additional clause of one additional two hour test per year, which I had provided, we have provided today earlier, and then additionally to, <clears throat> excuse me, to include that the applicant work with the neighbors to conduct testing at the optimal time, uh, sorry, um, we established the optimal time. Let me start over on that, I, I apologize. Uh, the first item is what I would recommended earlier in my presentation, and then the other part would be to change the timing in the condition to be from 8.30 a.m. to 3 p.m. instead of the 8.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. that was listed. Does that I, amendment seem to align with what was? Yeah, and, and probably consolidating the friendly amendment to just that makes sense because then you don't have to like figure out how to navigate the best time. Um, it's just before 3 p.m., 8.30 to 3 p.m., Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. I think we got it. Thank you. Uh, I think we have clarity. Um, before we call the vote, I'll simply note that because we the, the applicant is is appearing to be affirmative and accepting of, of the time constraints, um, I think it's fine to leave it in. Um, I think the, the spirit is that the applicant was going to try and optimize the time anyways. Um, and I do know that schedules change. And so, um, I, I probably would not have t changed the time window and, and just acknowledge the spirit of finding the best time for the neighborhood, um, but it appears that it works as is. Um, so I think I, at this point, I will go ahead and call the vote on. If the, I may through the chair, I'm sorry to interrupt. Please. Um, just one other detail. So we'd mentioned the two items. I uh, failed to also clarify 
uh, for amending this condition, there there is language that says it would be a test that's conducted on weekdays, and it sounds like there is a desire to have it on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, which is what the applicant has generally volunteered to uh, offer as their dates of testing. Is that also re requested in this condition amendment that we would want Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday to be the days instead of weekdays, which would be likely Monday through Friday? I, I was just reading that, the yeah, draft resolution in the staff report right. itself. Yeah, I didn't. Yeah, and, and it was purely because it was already there. So I assumed there was a reason. That's on page um, A3, A3 or uh, page 33 of the agenda packet. Yeah, so uh, the, the condition provides the kind of parameters. I think what the commission is referencing here are part of the findings, uh, which do identify the applicant's proposal, so kind of the expected timing and durations, whereas the condition kind of sets that kind of, you know, outer limits. So it, if the commission would like to modify the condition to identify in the findings the applicants, as, as Mr. Pruder mentioned, kind of proposal uh, without that added flexibility, that, that's certainly within the parameters of the commission this evening. So the motion can include an amendment or a modification to the recommended condition 2A to identify specific days, Tuesday through Thursday, versus uh, weekdays as staff identify in the condition. I'm personally weekday agnostic. If I may, um, we are approaching a 4th of July holiday, um, and probably the best day of the week that would disturb the fewest number of people might not be the middle of the week holiday. Um, and so I suspect that there are a number of times over the course of the calendar year where the, the least disturbing time might not be a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. It might be for some you know, event or holiday reason a Monday or a Friday. And so I think the spirit appears to be both in the written evidence and the presence here today that the, the applicant wants to find the least disturbing time for the neighborhood. Um, so if, if Commissioner Farrick is open to it, I suggest that we leave it as weekday. Uh, if it says weekday, right here, right now, it currently says Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So we can strike that and put weekday. I'm, I agree we want it to be the most flexible and amenable between the business and the neighborhood. So it's whatever the most um, reasonable, generous, flexible language is, I'd be supportive of that. Yeah. Just to clarify, so um, the findings and the condition don't necessarily need to track word for word, and so staff would regulate through the conditions, which do okay. identify weekdays. So Great. We'll, we'll change Let's... it to eight thirty to three weekdays. Perfect. If the commission would like, we're happy to change the findings to mention weekdays, but we don't think it's necessary. I'll leave that to you. Then let's say weekdays, and you can decide how specific you want all the pieces. Oh. Just want to clarify, I think the conditions are on page 78 of the agenda, A48. Um, so it's in a different part of the staff report. And they do say weekdays. Thank you. All right. Um, and so with that, I will go ahead and call a vote on uh, the motion by Commissioner Farrick, seconded by Commissioner Peruzzi. Um, Commissioner Peruzzi. Yes. Commissioner Doe. Yes. Commissioner Farrick? Yes. Commissioner Sillen? Yes. Commissioner Silverstein? Yes. And I am also a yes, uh, so that is six yeses um, and no dissent with one absence. Um, thank you so much for being here today, for engaging. Um, we wish you the best of luck. All right, um, which brings us to the end of our the public hearing portion of our meeting this evening. Um, we are now at G, informational items. Um, Mr. Parada, uh, are there any updates on upcoming com planning commission meetings and agenda or any other informational items? Uh, yes, thank you. So the next meeting will be July 8th. There is um, one item scheduled for that agenda. It is the proposed reconstruction of the Chevron service station, fueling station at 1399 Willow Road. Uh, that's the corner of Hamilton Avenue and Willow Road. Um, the proposal is part of the broader Willow Village project, but a separate item and separate action. 
uh, to enable the realignment of Hamilton Avenue as part of the Willow Village project. So um, that's coming forward uh, on July 8th is a use permit architectural control. And then, as I mentioned at the top of the meeting on July 22nd, the Planning Commission is scheduled to hold a uh, public hearing on the draft EIR for the Parkline Master Plan Project, as well as a study session on that project. And that concludes my updates. Happy to answer any general questions on those two um, future meeting dates. Commissioner Sillen, general questions on one of those two meeting dates. Yeah, sorry, just to clarify, on July 8th, are we also reviewing um, the item that was continued from today for Marmona Drive? Uh, no, good question. We are not. We continue that to a date uncertain uh, to allow staff to work with the applicant on um, potential ways to identify or to address the uh, compliance issues, and that may involve changing the words in the notice. So we, we're not prepared to notice to a date certain this evening. Got it. Thank you. Commissioner Doe, just wanted to um, let you know, uh, Mr. Prada and other commissioners, that I will be unable to attend July 8th. Thank you. Yes, I've heard from a number of commissioners. I think I have all the availabilities for July 8th and July 22nd up to date, but certainly if, if a commissioner has not emailed me, now would be a time. Commissioner Farrick, you can just let me know now. 22nd. I'm, I'm out. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, Vice Chair Eric will, ch will lead the July 8th meeting as I will also be absent. He has been updated, warned. <laughs> Commissioner Sillen. I believe I already let you know that I'd be gone on July 8th, Mr. Prada. Um, but if I didn't, here I am. Yes, so okay. with that, please no other commissioners be unavailable for July 8th because that will put us just at a quorum, we have five currently committed to July 22nd with Commissioner Farrick's update. So um, if commissioners can let me know as soon as possible, that would be very important. Um, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Prada. May I ask a, a favor? This seem, feels like a good time to remind folks about the guidelines around remote attendance. Could you just remind us how to think about that and when it is appropriate and how, how to sort of Yeah, that. certainly, thanks. Uh, I can definitely do it really quick. Uh, we'll probably follow up with a uh, email since this is starting to veer off of agendized topics, but I, I, I can appreciate the benefit of it. Um, there are multiple different ways. So the uh, kind of traditional Brown Act way of participating remotely is to participate from a remote location, identify that location on the agenda, post a notice at that location as well, that, you're, that there is a um, attendee participating from that location and, and members of the community can also join. Um, I would need to confirm this. I do not believe that participation would count towards a quorum. Uh, there are a number of other ways to participate remotely um, that have come out of um, the COVID-19 pandemic. And so there are certain kind of emergency participations that are allowed. Once again, there are, there are nuances around whether or not those participating remotely due to um, kind of the allowances under, under the um, order for, or the, the law regarding um, remote participation outside the Brown Act. Uh, some count towards the quorum and some do not. So, um, with that, it's best to be in person because that's that's how we ensure we have a quorum. I'm happy to send uh, an email update on that. We have sent one in the past. I know we have a number of new commissioners, so we can certainly do a, a reminder on ways to participate remotely. Thank you. I appreciate the reminder. Uh, I know that it is written in men, at least one, if not multiple places. I just didn't have it on quick recall, so I appreciate the reminder. Um, and with that, um, unless there are any other questions around the informational item. Seeing none, I will adjourn the meeting at 825.